What does it mean to be Muslim in America? We'll talk with the president of the Islamic Society of North America who says American Muslims in particular have an enormous responsibility to live as exemplary Muslims and to demythologize Islam to the American public. Hello and welcome to Penn State Public Broadcasting's Common Ground Lobby Talk, which is produced in collaboration with Penn State's Institute for the Arts and Humanities. I'm Patty Satalia. This is an open forum, and we invite dialogue between our special guest and our live audience. Let's begin with an introduction. Dr. Ingrid Madsen is the first woman president of the Islamic Society of North America, the post she was elected to in August of 2006. Raised Catholic in Canada, she converted to Islam at the end of her undergraduate studies, then traveled to Pakistan, where she worked with Afghan refugees. In 1999, she earned her Ph.D. in Islamic Studies from the University of Chicago and is now director of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program and professor at the McDonald Center for Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations at the Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. You converted uh, from uh, the Roman Catholic religion to Islam in your senior year in college. Um, converts are, are typically very passionate, and it's something that is very, very perplexing to many of us. Um, why did you convert? How did you become Muslim? Well, I think it's important to say that when I became a Muslim, when I encountered Islam, at that point I was an atheist or agnostic or maybe just simply indifferent, uh, not someone who was interested in, in religion or even had God in my life in any way. I had left the Catholic Church, uh, left faith behind as a teenager, and uh, never really looked back. So for me, when I encountered Islam uh, and embraced it, it was the way for me to bring God back into my life. And, and I did so because of the, the power of the Quran and reading that and, and what it said to me about my place in this creation. But you did describe yourself as a pious child and, and it was uh, a trip to, uh, to Paris and then to Afghanistan to work with um, Afghan refugees mm. where something happened. What was it that, that enhanced your vision of Islam? Well, um, I first met Muslims uh, as far as I know when I studied in Paris one summer uh, where I grew up in Canada, I don't think I knew any Muslims or even heard anything about Islam. So I was very fortunate that the first Muslims I met were uh, students from West Africa, mostly from Senegal, who were uh, just remarkable human beings, very dignified in the midst of great prejudice that they suffered in Parisian society. I mean, very uh, overt prejudice and racism. Um, but they had a dignity and a generosity of spirit um, that really impressed me and that made me want to know more about them and their background. Since then I've realized that they come from a uh, strong West African tradition of uh, Islamic Sufism which emphasizes a kind of openness to others and the importance of living uh, spiritually in everyday life and uh, they certainly did that and that really opened my heart. Interestingly enough, there are actually two converts in your family. You're one of seven, and you have an older sister who converted to uh, Judaism. It, tell us a little bit about that and what the reaction was in your household to this. Right. I guess uh, my family really does have a bit of a different experience than most uh, Canadian or American families, although as, as our society changes and integrates, I think this is becoming more common. My sister is uh, significantly older than I am, and... Uh, she met a Jewish man and fell in love and uh, wanted to marry him and for the sake of the family and their future children decided that for her to embrace Judaism would be the best thing. Uh, I think that may be one of the reasons why my family was a little bit confused when I chose to become a Muslim because it, no man was involved. Um, it was uh, my own choice um, as a spiritual choice and that um, uh, surprised them because I wasn't someone who seemed to be looking for a religion so it kind of hit them out of the blue and not knowing any Muslims or anything about Islam they were concerned they didn't know what this would mean for my life so it took a little bit of time for them to be able to be co comfortable with it realizing that it was something that um, that I could live and 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 have a good life with 
Help us understand this. Um, you have a doctorate in Islamic studies, and the two largest religions in the world, of course, are Christianity and Islam, both of which have divided. The Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. broke into uh, various denominations, and um, Muhammad left no specific instructions about who should take over um, and, and lead the uh, uh, Islam, mm -hmm. and the result was that that split into two mm -hmm. distinct groups, the Sunnis and the Shiites. What's the difference between the two, and does the Islamic Society of North America embrace mm -hmm. both groups? Right. Well, the major difference between Sunnis and Shiites um, is a theological difference based on the idea of succession to the Prophet Muhammad, and specifically who is authorized to um, interpret um, uh, the Quran and, and the uh, um, Islamic principles authoritatively. Shiites believe that that authority was passed down to specific individuals in, in the Prophet's family, whereas Sunnis believe that it's a collective responsibility of the community to struggle with these texts and precepts and come up with uh, their, uh, their own conclusion. Um, the Islamic Society of North America is open to all Muslims. Uh, demographically, we are a majority Sunni, but um, we have uh, Shiite members, and there's no uh, um, there's no criteria for sectarian uh, exclusionary criteria for our organization. In fact, we had a Shiite uh, president uh, when in our first um, manifestation as a Muslim Students Association. What's the relationship between the Islamic Society of North America and Middle Eastern Muslims? The relationship is only one of uh, uh, emotional ties as uh, part of the global Muslim community, but also uh, we have developed um, primarily out of the experience of immigrant Muslims who came to study in the United States, um, found themselves uh, uh, wanting to have some sense of community as Muslims in a, what to them was a foreign land, formed the Muslim uh, Students Association of Canada and the United States, thinking that eventually they would go back to their homes. Some of them did, but many stayed, uh, had families. Their children didn't want to go back to Egypt or Pakistan or wherever they came from. Uh, they realized that this was now their home and then uh, developed uh, the Islamic Society of North America as the next step, as the kind of fully adult organization that would represent all Muslims. And now our membership includes uh, primarily people who were born in this country, whether they're from a uh, Caucasian or African American um, community or second generation Muslims whose parents immigrated, but they themselves were born here. The organization itself was established back in 1963 and today you can count some 20,000 people among mm -hmm. uh, its members. Uh, what's the purpose or the mission of the Islamic Society of North America? Our mission is to be a, a, a common platform for the diversity of Muslims in North America and that includes individuals and organizations and communities. So in fact, our uh, umbrella embraces even more than those 20,000 individual members, thousands more who are represented in the over 300 um, mosques and Islamic centers that are affiliated with our organization, as well as professional organizations like the Islamic Medical Association that are part of our, um, of our membership body. Uh, Muslims in North America are highly diverse in terms of their outlook, uh, background, um, every, in every uh, aspect of demography that you could imagine. And what we seek to do is certainly provide guidance on some issues, but more than that, to provide a common platform for discussion, for dialogue, to engage uh, all the different aspects of this community so that we can um, come to, if not agreement, at least come to know each other and, and work for some common goals.
You were the vice president of the Islamic Society of North America for five years prior to be, uh, uh, being elected in August of 2006 as president. Many people look at this as maybe the starting point of something bigger, that the significance is not only that you're a woman, a woman but also that you're a non-immigrant. What do you believe is the significance mm -hmm. of your appointment? Well, certainly um, we're at the stage in our development as Muslims in North America where our leadership should reflect who we are um, as a community. And it's natural that, that by now this organization should have someone who's a native English speaker, for example. And this is not to in any way belittle the um, contributions of all those who served ahead of me. They did a wonderful job and, and built up this organization. But like every other Muslim community in the world, um, uh, we should be having institutions and leadership that is uh, homegrown and that is really embedded and, and relevant uh, to the society. So that's what I see as primarily important. Um, certainly being a female is something that has gotten a lot of attention. And, and I think what's the most interesting thing is the fact um, that it was such a non-issue for our members that um, it seems that it was a very natural uh, um, development to them that having served my two terms as vice president, I would now um, have the opportunity to serve as president. So I think for many of us that was more surprising than anything, the fact that there wasn't a lot of discussion about it. There are some, though, and I think it's a minority, who are opposed to a woman leading this organization. And in fact, there are some who use this saying, which is ascribed to the Prophet Muhammad, which translates roughly to, whenever God wants the destruction of a people, he makes a woman their leader. How do you respond to that? Well, certainly there are um, those people who believe that, that Muslim women shouldn't have public roles. And uh, the question is, what is their proof for that? Um, there are many, many sayings that are attributed to the Prophet Muhammad and Muslim scholars have always um, looked at those and tried to sort which are authentic and which are fabricated. Um, many of them were fabricated for political purposes or uh, people who wanted to support their position and that's what we have to look at when we see in fact, uh, and we, we weigh any particular saying against all the other things the Prophet Muhammad said, what he did and also the, the message of the Quran which is clearly um, uh, states that uh, Muslim women can contribute to the same level and in the same way as Muslim men. We see that, that women had public roles during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad and his immediate successors um, followed women who were in leadership positions. So when we look at the preponderance of evidence, um, I think we have to uh, give these other uh, reports their Are you place. saying that that particular saying can't justifiably be attributed to him? Well, this is a question of Hadith scholarship and uh, I would defer that to those who are have more uh, uh, um, who are specialists in that area, but there has been a lot of discussion about that statement and whether it, it in fact violates um, many other uh, clear Quranic statements about gender equality as well as other statements attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. In your role as the president of the Islamic Society of North America, you say you have detect what you would call Muslim fatigue among North America's mm -hmm. Americans. And in fact, you say, the sense I have from Americans is that they don't want to hear Muslim ta Muslims talking about Islam anymore. They just want us to do something to stop causing all these problems in their lives. And I'm wondering, is this the, uh, uh, the challenge for you as president? Um, uh, and how you're going, what you're going to do to make Islam better understood among mm -hmm. Americans. Mm -hmm. I think the first challenge is to show that Muslims are like other people in that uh, we have our good guys and our bad guys. <laughs> there, are, there are criminals in Muslim societies um, just as there are uh, criminals in Christian societies. The United States has around two million people in jail, probably most of them Christian. Um, so we don't judge uh, uh, people and a, a civilization and a religious community by the worst of them. And I think that's the, the real challenge because Americans are naturally interested in the ways that, that Islam is impacting their li lives. And the reality is that there were uh, people and there have been people who have used Islam to justify violence and terrorism 
and uh, in particular the terrorist acts of 9-11. That's a reality, so Americans are going to be first and foremost interested in that. And they want Muslims to do something about it. We would love to do something about it. Um, but what kind of role do we have? We have our voice, we have our writing, we have our example, but we are not ultimately in control of, of these people who are doing these things. And I think it's that sense of uh, collective guilt or responsibility that we really have to um, uh, try to avoid and explain to American people and have them see that it's unfair to put that burden on us. I want to ask you one more question and then I want to open it up to our audience for their questions. Um, terrorist killing in the name of Islam you say is not the true Islam. Describe the true Islam, the five pillars if you will, to help explain for those who don't know what exactly the, the doctrine or the, um, the, the underpinnings are of this religion. Well, Islam primarily is about belief in God and about the unity of God. And what that means is that Muslims recognize their limitations. That's why we try to submit ourselves and our lives to, uh, to in obedience to God. And what that means is that we live our lives uh, first in that awareness. We exhibit that through our acts of worship, as you say, the five pillars praying five times a day and ritual prayer, even more than that, I mean, supplications and invocations, but the ritual of prayer five times a day, fasting during the month of Ramadan, the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, paying yearly a significant amount of our wealth. In um, fact, 1% of, of your salary goes... One, well, 2.5% of a Muslim's wealth has to go for annually to the zakat, to the charity, for me, I have to pay 1% of my income to, to the Islamic Society of North America as a member of the, of the board. Um, so that's an extra commitment. Um, but all of these things uh, are to show our gratitude to God. And that's what Islam really is about. It's about showing gratitude for all of the things uh, that he's given us, even our own, our own selves, our, our ability to... Uh, to speak and to live in community with each other and try to uh, live in the most merciful and humane way that we can. Is there a question in the audience? Uh, yes, I wondered whether uh, you were concerned about the uh, potential for uh, the radical Islam uh, group to become uh, involved in, in mosques around the United States and sort of uh, dominate the uh, voice of Islam in the United States and what you and your organization could do in response to this? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, the challenge in, in American Islam in particular is that we do not have a, a hierarchical church structure in fact, uh, we have a very loose kind of voluntary association. Um, and because of that, each community is individual. So there's no, um, our organization has no authority to go into any mosque and demand that they uh, run a certain way or speak a certain way. Um, but what we can do and what we are doing is developing a set of best practices for mosques and Islamic centers to develop guidelines for those communities, how their governance structure should work, what qualifications there should be for imams, what are the kind of, uh, what's the kind of training that an imam should have, um, and, to, and to then once we have developed these guidelines, offer training programs. So we have a number of training programs for imams to help them understand their context, especially if they've come from another country. 
um, because the reality is that many communities are still um, bringing imams who have been trained in other countries who may be good uh, preachers, they may be good theologians, but they don't understand necessarily the context of their community here. So we're putting a lot of energy into that, trying to help uh, orient them, train them, and then ultimately and ideally have our own seminaries in this country where we can um, have our own children and our own young people be uh, a generation of leaders. Uh, you say that American Muslims uh, have a special obligation to help stop the violence that is committed by Muslims in the name of Islam. Why do American Muslims have this special duty to do that? Well, as I said before, we don't necessarily have any special power, but we do have an obligation because we have the freedom to talk about these issues. And the reality is that most Muslims in the world live in uh, environments where they don't have that freedom uh, because their political rights are suppressed, uh, their freedom of speech is very limited, um, they may not have access to, to the resources that we have. So there's a moral obligation for us to exercise that kind of leadership. And it doesn't mean there's anything special or unique about Americans, but we have this rich uh, diverse Muslim community. We have Muslims from every part of the world. So we can draw upon their experiences, their heritage, their perspective, and, and debate these issues in a way, in a free way, um, so that we can then in encourage a discussion um, in other countries. The other thing is that we're Americans. We're part of this country. And the United States is heavily engaged in uh, uh, Muslim countries you know, in their economic policies, their political policies. So we also need to look at it as American citizens. How can we um, be a bridge of understanding between the United States, our policies, and uh, Muslims uh, in okay, other countries? Go ahead. Well, you, you alluded to um, the, the responsibilities of being a Muslim American. Um, but I wonder if you could say, um, given the sort of stereotype that, that is sort of pervading even before 9-11. I mean, I was reminded that in the Oklahoma City bombing, the initial attribution was to um, Muslims, or at least Arabs. Um, how, do, what do, how do you, do you advise members of your group, and particularly young people, I guess I'm interested in knowing, about dealing with that stereotype and still exercising their freedom of speech as Americans? I'm, I'm really glad you brought up um, uh, young people because they're the ones that I'm most concerned about and I'll tell you why. This kind of stereotyping and distrust of Muslims is having a large negative effect on them. I have a lot of interaction with Muslims who are uh, counselors, uh, psychiatrists, um, working in mental health fields, uh, youth workers, and they've seen uh, a dramatic rise in uh, depression, anxiety, um, uh, all uh, indicators of stress because of this. They feel that um, they can't present themselves just as, as they are, but they have to somehow explain or, or prove themselves that they aren't violent. Um, you know, they're just kids. They don't know. They don't understand what's going on in the world, but they're being asked to explain these things. So it's really problematic, and this is where, as a community, we need to work with teachers and those who touch the lives of young people to uh, alert them to this dynamic and try to find ways uh, to ease their stress somewhat. Um, the only solution really is education. Uh, it's challenging for a community, a minority community that's at most 2% of the population, to impact the, the other 98% of the population in a positive way with their message when at the same time uh, we're constantly being bombarded uh, with images overseas um, of war in Iraq, of this kind of violence. So it's an enormous challenge, but I have to say that, that we're also very fortunate that we are not alone in doing it. There are so many um, faith-based organizations, interfaith groups, other religious organizations who are sincere in wanting to help us and to help get that message out. 
And we have, in my work at Hartford Seminary, I interact uh, with, with priests and ministers who themselves are educating their congregations on Sundays and saying, we cannot fall back into these old patterns of collective guilt and stereotyping. So to me, that, that is proof of really the best that is in American society. And it makes me hopeful, even amid, uh, amidst all of uh, the bad news. And we'll take another question. Um, in, in just a moment, we'll get a microphone to you. So until that microphone gets there, um, there was a, a recent Gallup poll that showed that nearly 40% of Americans admit prejudice um, against or towards Muslims, and in, also that uh, one in five Americans said they would not want a Muslim as a neighbor. How do you respond to that? Well, what's interesting is the other statistic that the uh, majority of Americans who have a positive view of Muslims do so because they have a Muslim neighbor or a Muslim friend or a co-worker. So I think that shows that the problem really is that of the fear of the unknown or maybe the fear of the image that's being projected. That really is the challenge and um, certainly programs like this uh, and others are doing their part in, in um, humanizing Muslims in uh, trying to present a, a balance to the negative images that we get. But it's, it's challenging, and um, I think that, that what's, what's required is, as in many other areas, um, for Americans to be a little bit more sophisticated in their consumption of news, and perhaps to be a little bit more self-aware of their own, the way that their own emotions can be manipulated um, by, by news and information and images. Now you mentioned a moment ago the news and the media and our consumption of, of those things and of course many Americans have, have seen the documentary The Cult of the Suicide Bomber uh, or at least they've seen the movie that was based on it which starred George Clooney Syriana um, and in it uh, in the documentary there is a scene um, where thousands of people are in a mosque in Iran chanting death to America mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how your organization can counteract the powerful message that that sends. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that is a powerful message, and it's a frightening message. And it's also frightening when we look and we see that even in America, uh, there, are, um, there are churches where the message on Sunday is that Muslims are evil. Uh, Muslims are, are uh, people who should not be part of this country. Um, that, that the government should use its power, in fact, to, um, to subdue and, uh, Muslims. Those things happen in this country, and when I see those, those group uh, pictures, um, I remember uh, the pictures that we saw of Nazi Germany, where you would have Hitler um, talking in front of large crowds uh, of people and whipping up their emotions. And I think as Americans, we have to be very sober and consider in what way the same thing could happen to us. We may not be sitting in a stadium, but we're sitting millions of us together in our homes, having our emotions manipulated. But there also was the time when, when Afghanistan was first attacked um, in response to September 11th. The first attack and the announcement of it was uh, announced in, uh, on, on uh, uh, Sunday football game, large screens, thousands of Americans sitting in a stadium and they all got up and cheered when this was announced. And that's frightening. You talked a moment ago about what it's like for a, a child, a Muslim child in America. What's it like for an adult? Have, have you been the victim of uh, prejudice? Of course, I'm very privileged because I work, um, I work in an environment that values uh, religion and um, uh, religious expression. Of course, walking down the street, people wouldn't know that, and I've had my random uh, rude comment here and there, but uh, far more positive comments, far more occasions of people just giving me a smile, clearly wanting to say, it's okay, I, you know, I accept you. Um, uh, even non-verbally, but uh, there is a concern. Um, many people are having increasing challenges in their workplace 
We've heard many more um, cases of employment discrimination, uh, Muslims who are being fired or prevented from promotion in their job because they are Muslim. Um, certainly the number of hate crimes generally has increased enormously. Um, the Council on American Islamic Relations has been documenting that, and the numbers are quite frightening. Um, so there are, uh, uh, there is a problem. There is a problem, and it's at that point incumbent upon the government to really take leadership. Fortunately, the, um, the Department of Justice and the EEOC have taken a number of cases and have done a good job. But at the same time, you know, we have this kind of mixed message. You have, you have those cases, and then on the other hand, we see the mistreatment of prisoners, of Muslim prisoners. There was recent news about Jose Padilla, um, who has been virtually tortured um, as a, an enemy combatant. And when, when ordinary people see that this kind of thing is going on, um, I'm afraid that it might give them some kind of license to feel that they too can mistreat Muslims. You mentioned government, and of course, uh, Britain's Tony Blair said that the headscarf separates Muslims and, and shouldn't be used. And I'm wondering what your reaction is to that and, and what the purpose of it is, what it means to you. Well, what's interesting is that um, uh, Tony Blair was supporting Jack Straw, who, who was protesting against the face, the face veil. Um, so they said, well, the head covering's okay, but the face veil is too, is too much, and this is a sign of separation of society from society and should be rejected. And I don't know if you've been in London, but I've walked around London before, and I've seen some really interesting ways of dressing. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've seen nine-inch purple mohawks. Um, I've seen multiple facial piercings, and I've never heard uh, the British government uh, comment. on any of those modes of dress. So clearly there is, uh, there is selective treatment there, and I think it's unfair. Um, uh, these women should be free to wear what they want. Um, it's the government's job as a servant of the people to represent the people, not to dictate to them uh, their way of dressing. Whatever I, you know, I feel personally about the face veil is, is something else, but I certainly support the right of individuals to wear what, the, what they wish. And um, so this was simply a politicization of, uh, um, you know, of, of an issue that should never never have uh, been said. Okay. You had a question, sir? Uh, yes. Um, do you believe that the American news media have been fair in their presentation of the situation of uh, Muslims in America, or do you think they have contributed to the problems that you're talking about? Well, the news media is, is diverse, and I've had great experiences with, with, uh, most, with commercial media, uh, but public television and radio is much better, <laughs> and uh, that's just the reality. Um, commercial media is about making money, and it's, it's things that are sensational um, that make money. Uh, conflict uh, attracts attention. I think of uh, the Pope's visit to Turkey, and what was interesting was you could see that the media kept was looking for conflict. 
And they kept framing this visit in terms of conflict when, in fact, any uh, a fair observer would have said that the real story was the lack of conflict. And was the real story was that in the wake of a number of um, incidents in Europe where there were, where there were this uh, tension and stress between uh, Muslim communities and, and others, that uh, things worked out quite well. So I think, you know, I, I don't think we can ever really change that because that's the nature of commercial media. So we need to, um, we need to be uh, sophisticated observers of news, I think, and consumers of news. And we'll get a microphone to, uh, can we get a microphone to someone here? Could you talk a little about the Muslim definition of God and how it might differ from the Christian notion? Well, um, the word uh, God um, that is used in the Quran, Allah, the primary word, is the same word that, that Christian Arabs use to call God. Um, so in terms of whether this is the same God or a different God, I think we have to say that certainly the Qur'an recognizes that there's one God. And that people have approached God through different ways. Um, Christians, uh, generally, you, you have to believe in the divinity of, of Jesus to be a Christian. I think that most Christian theologians would say that, that not accepting the divinity of Jesus would take you outside of Christianity, although there are um, certain Christian theologians who would say otherwise. Um, but that really is the, the main difference. Uh, Muslims see um, Jesus and all the prophets uh, as, as perfect recipients of the divine light. And as one of my, my colleagues um, uh, Timothy Winter, who's a lecturer at Cambridge, said is that what, what the Muslim view was that um, Christians mis mis mistook the perfect mirror of the divine light for the divine light itself. So really that's where the difference is. Um, God in the Quran is, is uh, described in many ways with many attributes and that's how Muslims approach God through his attribute of mercy and kindness and loving and forgiver and uh, creator. So that's how we come to know God. Sometimes people say that um, uh, the Muslim God is so transcendent that he's unapproachable, but that's clearly not the case. Um, the Quran describes God as closer than your jugular vein. So God is, is always the nearest Thing to you without being manifest in, in any part of creation. But another interesting difference, and we'll take a question in a moment, is uh, Christians have statues and paintings and, and so forth of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. and there aren't uh, those kinds of representations of the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, it's forbidden, considered mm -hmm. blasphemous. Why is that the case? Uh, Islam, uh, above everything, uh, wants to maintain the uh, uniqueness of God as distinct from creation. So the attempts of humans to portray God um, in any way is considered to be uh, highly presumptuous, <laughs> at least. And then the fear is that by, by portraying prophets, the Prophet Muhammad, for example, by making depictions, that people then may start to take that as, as an icon, as an um, avenue of worship, and that's to be avoided. Um, so that Muslims try to maintain that connection of God 
to, that connection with God directly through uh, through prayer, but also by embodying um, uh, the actions of the Prophet Muhammad that taught us how we can approach God. What kind? What way should we pray um, to? find that path to God. All right, we have a question down here. I'm interested in Sufism, and I'd like to know what is the relationship between a Sufism and Islam, and why we haven't heard much about Sufism in the West. Mm -hmm. Sufism is the, uh, is the mystical tradition in Islam. It's part of Islamic uh, uh, religious life and culture. Um, Sufism in its various forms is everywhere in the Muslim world. Uh, traditionally, in the pre-modern period especially, every Muslim had a legal school that he or she followed, a theological school, and also a, a, a spiritual tradition um, through the different Sufi brotherhoods. Now these, uh, these uh, spiritual paths uh, took all different forms. Some of them, I think any objective observer would say, really veered away from, from Islam and uh, became quite syncretic and, and picked up many of the uh, traditions or practices that non-Muslims performed. But most, uh, the, the majority of Muslims stayed within Orthodox Islam, but, but Sufism was an added discipline to enhance their spirituality of Islam. I think many Americans know about some Sufi figures, people like Rumi or um, Hafiz, who were great poets and also uh, uh, Sufi leaders. Um, but it is something that perhaps is less well known, um, again, because uh, good news travels slow <laughs> and bad news travels fast. <laughs> As a Muslim, very interested to talk about how we deal with difficulties. Uh, because uh, when we have public discussions, inevitably because of the context uh, in which such discussions take place, we, we try to emphasize, uh, and I think this is a good thing, the good news and, and the positive. But you, you said something to me which struck me as very important and very honest. And you said that there are sometimes actions among us Muslims which are more undermining and dangerous and offensive. Um, both to ourselves and, and also to uh, the wider world. And I was wondering how you deal with some of these, these difficult issues of great differences, whether they're theological or political or strategic. Uh, because I, I think uh, it, it heartens me that um, there is that degree of self-reflection, but, but also agreeing to look at the difficult subjects and, and deal with them creatively. Uh, thank you. Um... Ultimately, our, our goal as Muslims is to live righteously and ethically. Um, our goal is not to uh, um, be some kind of uh, group that just cheers whatever it does. That, in fact, is what Ibn Khaldun, the great uh, medieval Arab scholar, called asabi, a group sentiment. Religion isn't supposed to be group sentiment. It's not supposed to be uh, about just sustaining and, and justifying your, your group beyond anything. Yes, we're supposed to build community, but what is that community built around? If it's not built on piety and righteousness and the search for what is good and better, then there's no value in it. Um, and the Quran says very clearly that if Muslims make the same mistakes and, and choose to turn away from God, um, and live uh, a life that is unjust, then we will go down the same path. We will lose our opportunity to be moral leaders and we'll be replaced by someone else. So that's the priority. To me, the priority is our own uh, internal structure, our development as a, as a community. We do have to defend ourselves from uh, external attacks but we have to be proportionate. What is an attack? Clearly, uh, uh, legislation that discriminates against Muslims and, and impedes Muslims' abilities to live as Muslims is a problem. That is a real threat. And we face some of those threats, and we need to put resources into defending ourselves 
Um, and unfortunately, when we do that kind of defense, it takes away some of our ability to deal with our own internal problems. Um, after 9-11, so much money in the Muslim community and human resources went into legal defense and to defend the civil rights of Muslims in this country that could have been put into you know, developing our institutions to be more responsible and responsive to the needs. So that's unfortunate, but, um, but it's something that we have to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that, that there's an eagerness and a hunger among Muslims to take responsibility for their own communities. And, and I love to see that. I love the fact that there are many Muslims who say, you know what, this is my mosque, this is my community. I'm, I'm not going to just sit back anymore and you know, listen to some speech that is, that is offensive, that is sexist, that is whatever. But um, I'm going to take some responsibility for what's going on here and, and uh, try to correct that. We're going to wrap things up here, so I'd like you to end by giving us a, a take-home message for Muslims and non-Muslims and, and what you as the president of the Islamic Society of North America will be um, putting your energies into when you leave here. Well, my, my main message is that uh, as, a, as a religious person, as someone who's trying to please God, I have to say that we need to do a better job, all of us that, that uh, God did not give us the resources that we have, the enormous resources that we have in America uh, so that we could fight each other more sophisticatedly. Um, he gave us those resources so that we could improve the world, so that we could care for the hungry, so that we could demonstrate compassion and mercy in our lives. We need to do that in community. Um, that means that Muslims need to reach out to their neighbors. They need to reach out to Christians and Jews and those of goodwill who are trying to improve the situation. And, and Americans um, need to stop being afraid. They need to, to stop giving in to that fear and have a certain confidence. This is a strong country. This is a country that, can, um, that has undergone uh, uh, many um, pressures um, economic, political, military in the past and has always come out on top when it acted ethically and morally and lived up to its values. So stop being afraid and, and don't give up what makes you an American um, for the sake of fear. And if you reach out to your Muslim neighbor, you will find by and large, although there are some some of us are rude and obnoxious and not that nice. But I think by and large, you'll, you'll find a good experience with most of us. And your priorities in the, in the coming year? Priorities are standards, 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 and uh, developing a new generation of Muslim leaders who are going to work in this country to make Islam uh, a responsible, relevant, dynamic faith community. Oh. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid Madsen, for being with us. We really appreciate it from the Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. Thanks so much for joining us.